This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. It's over. The Dow's longest win streak in years has come to an end, and late day earnings from Visa could set the tone for tomorrow. Mega mergers blocked. The Justice Department says two big health insurance combinations would not only increase costs, but also threaten care. Home sweet home. Sales hit their highest pace in nine years, and one type of buyer in particular is showing up in force. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, July 21st. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. A pause in the rally. The Dow's win streak, its longest in more than three years, is over. The blue chip index had climbed for nine straight sessions. Seven of them were record closes. That was its longest winning streak in some time. But earnings came in mixed, and the European Central Bank's decision not to add stimulus to that region's economy weighed on sentiment and pressured stocks. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 77 points to 18,517. 18, the Nasdaq was off 16. The S&P 500 fell 7. Dow component Visa could set the tone for tomorrow. The world's largest payments network operator reported a steep drop in quarterly profit and added $5 billion to its stock buyback plan. Visa did earn 69 cents a share. That was three cents better than estimates. But if you include charges related to an acquisition, profits were actually 76% lower than a year ago. Revenue at $3.6 billion, slightly below expectations. Shares volatile in after hours trading. But the big news from the company today wasn't found in its quarterly results, but rather in a partnership with PayPal. Kayla Tausche has more. PayPal and Visa are familiar foes in the payments industry, but today with a new deal, the two companies became frenemies. A new strategic partnership allows Visa to capture more business from PayPal customers. PayPal saying it will no longer steer Visa customers toward using a bank account and instead will try to encourage them more to use Visa debit and credit card accounts. But there's something in it for PayPal, too. They will get a cut of all the volume they send Visa's way. But they also get access to millions of points of sale for Visa contactless payments at brick and mortar merchants. That's something PayPal has wanted for a long time. Visa customers also get the ability to move money through PayPal accounts from their Visa accounts instantaneously. For now, it looks like two companies that couldn't agree much have come together to make a deal that will hopefully be mutually beneficial. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kayla Tausche in New York. Another Dow component, Travelers, saw quarterly profits fall to their lowest level since 2012. The property casualty insurer said costs from catastrophes like the Fort McMurray wildfire in Alberta rose while income from investments fell. Higher catastrophe claim costs are expected to hurt earnings across the industry. Shares of the Dow component fell fractionally in today's session. And now to a former Dow component, General Motors. Shares of the automaker accelerated after the automaker posted much better than expected earnings for the second quarter. The stock rose more than 1.5% and is now trading right around its IPO price. The company is also raising its earnings guidance for the rest of the year. And as Phil LeBeau reports, it's all because of trucks, SUVs, and the American consumer. Talk about zooming profits. GM set 19 financial records last quarter, many due to strong sales in the U.S., where demand for new pickups and SUVs is not slowing down. Not only that, people are paying more for the models they're buying at Chevy, Buick, GMC, and Cadillac dealerships, partially because they're asking for features to keep them connected behind the wheel, but also because certain models, like GM's mid-size pickup trucks, are connecting with buyers right now. But GM is also profiting because of its decision to cut back on less profitable fleet sales, vehicles that are sold at a lower price to rental car companies, government agencies, and corporations. It's a move that has lowered GM's dominance in market share. But GM would rather sell fewer vehicles at a higher profit. After six straight years of rising sales, analysts are worried consumers are running out of gas. But GM's CFO doesn't see that happening. We still expect to see strong industry performance in the U.S. for the foreseeable future. Uh, clearly, 
The results in June were a little bit less than what we expected, but the fundamentals are there for continued strong performance, and, and that's our baseline assumption for the rest of the year. Stevens did tell analysts that General Motors is bracing for sales in Europe to slow down as that market adjusts to life after Brexit. If that happens, General Motors could see a slight loss in Europe over the next couple of quarters. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Chicago. Now to more on today's decision by the European Central Bank to leave interest rates unchanged. While that was mostly expected, President Mario Draghi also stopped short of pledging fresh stimulus in the future. Julia Chatterley has more now from Frankfurt. Reassurance provided by Mario Draghi, the head of the European Central Bank today, but not a lot else. Standing pat on any future policy as far as the reaction of the markets and the impact of the Brexit vote, he said we're in the dark. We don't know and we've got to wait for the data to feed through. So that's a case of hanging on in there until September when they update their forecasts. In terms of some of the concerns about the bank running out of options to buy the sovereign bonds of the likes of Germany in particular, the bank said they didn't even discuss what the options are in order to address that. So despite analysts' concern out there, the ECB here saying, look, we're just not that concerned at this moment. Then on the banks, he was quite interesting. He made a point of suggesting that for all the risks and the concerns that we saw in banking stocks in the aftermath of the Brexit vote, he said the banks are in a far stronger position today than they were even back as far as 2012. I'm pretty confident that a strong supervision and a robust regulation and better communication indeed by the supervisory authorities, the EBA and all this will still improve the the situation and the perception in uh, in uh, in the rest of the world's eyes. An interesting response from Mario Draghi there. On the one hand, he was supporting the banks and saying they are in a better condition. But on the other hand, he admitted to me, look, he doesn't also want to downplay the risks at this stage. On that, we've got stress test results coming out at the back end of next week. So that's what you have to watch. But as far as policy is concerned, guys, you have to pack your bags, go on summer holidays, and I'll see you back here in September. The Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Chatterley in Frankfurt. Thank you, Julia. The number of Americans filing for first-time unemployment benefits fell last week. According to the Labor Department, jobless claims dropped by 1,000 to a seasonally adjusted 253,000. The number has been below the 300,000 mark for the past 72 weeks. That's the longest such streak since 1973. Home sales moved a little bit higher in June and hit the highest pace in about nine years. The National Association of Realtors says existing home sales rose 1.1 percent last month. A lack of supply is keeping sales from being even stronger. But there is a bright side. As Diana Olick reports, first-time home buyers may finally be coming back to the market. 32-year-old Jorge Alborda already owns a trendy restaurant in Arlington, Virginia. But only recently could he afford to become a homeowner. It was a little bit too pricey, so I started looking in different places, uh, also in D.C., and so it was a very long uh, process. But Alborta, who came to the U.S. from Bolivia 12 years ago, was willing to put in the time. He managed to find a townhouse in D.C. and qualified for some assistance. I always wanted to, you know, purchase a, a home and uh, live the American dream. That dream is moving further out of reach for some. The median price of a home sold in June was nearly 5% higher than a year ago, according to the National Association of Realtors. That's because supply is down from a year ago and has been heading down now for over a year. Tight supply means more competition. In May, we saw the average days on market in D.C. at 12 days, so less than two weeks. Things are moving pretty quickly. And nationally in June, days on market fell to the lowest in seven years, according to Redfin. Nearly one quarter of homes sold in just two weeks. To meet the demand, builders are finally starting to put up cheaper homes again, but buyers have to pay a higher price in terms of convenience. Builders are willing to go farther out now than they were before, farther from the urban core into the more remote suburban areas, 
and get lots and develop them, and then they can offer homes in these affordable price ranges. But millennial buyers seem to like the city life, waiting longer to get married, have children, and consider the suburbs. For Alborda, there was simply no appetite to leave town. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. Still ahead, high stakes. Why tonight's speech by Donald Trump may be the most important and most scrutinized in his entire career. The Justice Department is taking a hard stance against two health insurance mega-mergers. Regulators are suing to block Anthem's proposed purchase of Cigna and Aetna's merger with Humana. Regulators say the combination would harm competition. We've been reporting that such a move was likely, and today it became official. And Bertha Coombs has the details. The Justice Department says when the nation's five largest health insurers compete, consumers benefit. But Aetna's $37 billion deal to acquire Humana and Anthem's $54 billion deal for Cigna would reshape the health care landscape for the worse. They would leave much of the multi-trillion dollar health insurance industry in the hands of just three mammoth insurance companies, drastically constricting competition. The DOJ's antitrust chief praised the insurers even as he argued the deals must be blocked, saying Aetna and Humana's competition have helped rein in costs in the Medicare Advantage market, as have Anthem and Cigna in the large employer market. There is quality competition going on, innovation going on. You reduce the number of players in any market, from Medicare Advantage, for national employers looking for coverage for their employees. You run the risk that that innovation will be stopped. You run the risk that insurance premiums will go up. Aetna and Humana vow to fight the DOJ's lawsuit. Aetna's chief says they've secured strong insurers to buy plans in Medicare markets where they overlap. And he contends working together, they'll continue to innovate for seniors. Both of our plans have the second and third highest star ratings in the United States because we've invested in the quality of the network we've put together for them, the quality of service, and seniors like our products. And we think we can do more of that. So we're willing to take this all the way to the very end. But it won't be easy. It has been 12 years since the DOJ has lost an antitrust case in court. Still, Anthem and Cigna also say they'll fight, calling the DOJ's decision to block their merger misguided. They also argue together they can push for lower prices from increasingly large hospitals and physician groups. But regulators worry consumers won't see the savings. Mergers may indeed increase the profits of Aetna and Anthem but they would do so at the expense of consumers, employers, and health professionals across the country. Well, both Aetna and Anthem say they'll continue to pursue a settlement with the DOJ. Officials here say right now the only way they see these cases being settled is in court. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bertha Coombs, Washington. To Cleveland now, where Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump will officially accept his party's nomination for president tonight. Trump will speak directly to the American people and make the case for why he should be elected 45th president. John Harwood joins us this evening from Cleveland. John, welcome. What is Trump's job one tonight? Look, the speech he's giving tonight, Tyler, is on a whole different level from the exposure he's had on television before. This is when a huge swath of the general election electorate is going to be watching him and thinking about him as a potential president. So job one is to come across to the American people as someone that they can see behind the desk in the Oval Office, that they can see as commander in chief. Donald Trump hasn't always looked that way in his campaign, but he's got a chance to do it tonight. Ivanka Trump, his daughter, who is an accomplished businesswoman, um, both with her, with her own fashion line, but also within the Trump organization, is going to be speaking before him and introducing her father. What do we know about what she might say to humanize her father or put forward um, some of those presidential qualities? 
Well, I think like uh, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump before her, uh, she is a very poised young woman, uh, somebody who will reflect well on her father simply by delivering a good speech. But in addition to that, she could give some texture and background about him as a father, as a grandfather, as somebody who uh, uh, she has seen in all sorts of situations different from what anyone in the public has seen. That unique testimony that they can give about their father could be very valuable if she pulls it off. John, an interesting night ahead, and it'll have to go a fur piece to be more interesting than last night. John Harwood. <laughs> That's right. John Harwood in Cleveland. Thanks again. Sales growth disappoints <clears throat> at Starbucks, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The coffee chain saw same-store same sales rise 4 percent, but analysts were looking for a nearly 6 percent gain. Overall, revenue for the quarter also missed estimates, but profits were in line. Shares initially fell in extended hours following the report, but ended the regular session up 6 cents to 57.60. Chipotle returned to profitability in its latest quarter, but the results still weren't good enough. Both profit and revenue came in shy of expectations, and the burrito chain's same-store sales fell 23 percent as the company continues to try to recover after last year's health scares. Chipotle initially fell a bit after the earnings, while ending the day down a fraction to 4.1807. Sales at AT&T rose in its latest quarter thanks in part to the telecommunications company's merger with satellite TV provider DirecTV. But despite that increase, results weren't good enough to top revenue targets. The company also reported profit in line with estimates and reaffirmed its outlook for the year. Shares of AT&T initially fell in the extended session, but finished the day down a fraction to 42.52. Shares of Southwest Airlines fell their most in seven years. Lower fuel costs helped drive profit higher, but that wasn't enough to hit targets, and revenue was also shy of forecasts. That news sent shares down 11 percent to 37.32. Biogen topped profit and revenue forecasts thanks to strong performance in its multiple sclerosis and hemophilia businesses. The biotech company also announced a $5 billion share buyback program and raised its guidance. Biogen also said its CEO would step down in the next few months. Shares up 7 percent on the news to 282.45. Profit fell nearly 20 percent at Union Pacific as weak demand for consumer goods help hit results, but earnings still managed to match Wall Street targets. Revenue at the railroad operator didn't fare as well, missing the mark. The company's CEO said there are still challenges out there. We are still facing some of the very same headwinds we've faced in the last four or five quarters. Uh, natural gas pricing, uh, replacing coal for a source of electricity, a strong U.S. dollar getting in the way of exports, uh, the, the shale energy related activity being pretty depressed. But uh, we are seeing sequential improvement, and that's, that's encouraging. Shares fell 3% to $90.93. Domino's hit a new high after the pizza chain posted results that topped expectations. The beat was largely attributed to robust store expansion and a surge in revenue from the company's supply chain business. Domino's shares up more than 5.5% to 144.66. Fox News Chief Roger Ailes has resigned. He stepped down today in the wake of a sexual harassment scandal. He denies the charges. Ailes built one of the most influential, profitable brands in news, one responsible for about a fifth of parent company's 21st Century Fox's profits. Ailes will get an exit package worth about $40 million. 21st Century Fox executive chairman Rupert Murdoch will become chair and acting CEO of Fox News. Senior analyst Tuna Amobi follows Fox for S&P Global Market Intelligence, and he joins us now. Tuna, welcome, as always. Let's start, first of all, with your reaction. I mean, this this developed and came to a conclusion rapidly. Indeed, it did. Um, you know, I think obviously if you're a casual observer, this is bombshell news. Um, however, I think from an investment perspective, I, 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 if history is anything to go by, you know, we expect investors to shake off the news. But clearly, Roger Isles is um, a larger than life personality within uh, Fox News, which is almost synonymous with his tenure. Um, obviously, Fox News is an extremely important asset for um, you know, for, for, for 20, 21st French Century Fox. Um, but I think on the, on the bright side, they've been successful in signing a lot of long-term contracts, which should keep them going until they can get steady hands to replace Roger Isles. So you do not see this as a, as a near or maybe even a long-term threat to the stock price or to the profitability of Fox News? 
Well, near term, you're likely to see you know, some headline risk around this. There's also potential issues with um, succession, um, you know, Rupert um, taking over the, um, you know, the running of Fox News, obviously um, kind of a more, more like a Band-Aid. Um, so all eyes are going to be um, on who is going to step into uh, those gigantic shoes. Um, you know, I can't frankly think of any potential candidates, um, but there's a number of names that have been mentioned. I wouldn't expect the company to focus solely internally. So there, those are big shoes to feel. And I think from an investment perspective, um, this is something investors are going to be watching very closely, given the significance right. of Fox News. You know, given the fact that Rupert Murdoch is stepping in to uh, take over from Mr. Ailes, rather than Rupert Murdoch's two sons, who have been assuming uh, the running of the company, does that say anything about Rupert's relationship with his sons as it pertains to running the business? Well, you know, I think um, on the one hand, I think, um, you know, Rupert needed to show, you know, uh, as kind of uh, make sure that it's an orderly transition. There's been some history with the sons versus, um, you know, Roger Al. So I think they also w wanted to manage the perception, you know, side of this. Um, so all in all, I, I, there's no question right now that this is a generational change from Rupert to the sons. Mm -hmm. The question becomes, you know, what impact do they see, you know, how, how do they kind of manage this, this transition? What impact does it have within the newsroom? Um, there's any number of things that could happen here, and we only hope that the company will be able to navigate this, okay. you know, quite successfully. We'll let you go, Tuna. Thank you so much for your perspective. Tuna Amobi with S&P Global Market Intelligence. Coming up, why Warren Buffett, Jamie Dimon, and Mary Barra and others held a secret meeting about the future of corporate America. CEOs of some of the nation's most valuable companies held a secret meeting to discuss the state of publicly traded companies. As reported by the New York Times, a group of business leaders met over the past year to address how to make the marketplace more attractive for privately held companies. Today, the group released a public letter with what they call common sense principles that suggest how current executives should lead their businesses. Warren Buffett was a part of that group, and this is what he said today about Berkshire Hathaway becoming a public company. I originally would have preferred Berkshire Hathaway to be a private company, uh, and over the years, my view on that's changed 180 degrees. I, I enjoy uh, having Berkshire being a public company. I enjoy having, I don't know whether we have a million shareholders or even more, but I, 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 I like the fact that People put their trust in us and, and that we treat them like partners and they feel like partners. J.P. Eggers is a professor of management at New York University Stern School of Business. Uh, he's here to discuss this with us. You know, there were a lot of uh, things in this letter and in the, in the reporting surrounding it. Why would a company want to go public today? There's so much more money in the private markets than there used to be that one of the main reasons for going public to cash out may not be as uh, compelling. Well, for many of the startup firms, that still is a very compelling reason because the initial investors who have put their money in at the VC rounds and the angel rounds early on are still looking for a way to cash out. They can cash out through kind of subsequent rounds that kind of buy out the early investors, but it becomes a little more complicated. And certainly if you're looking for a, a way to get a major capital inf infusion for some sort of a infrastructure expansion or something like that, then the, the, there's still an appeal to be going mm -hmm. public. But at the same time, administratively, it's more difficult to be a public company. In addition to that, we're increasingly seeing the board have more power than the CEO. So there's less incentive for those who are at the, at the top tiers to run a public company versus a private company. I, I think this is absolutely true, right? If you are a CEO of a company that, that is privately held and you don't need to cash out, either for yourself or for your investors or for a big capital expansion to go public, then there's no reason you should be wanting to do this, right? Why would you want to sub subject yourself to quarter, quarterly earnings reports and analyst phone calls and 
earnings guidance and things like that. When you can actually just focus on running your business, you've got to deal with your board and your investors and keeping them happy. But it's a lot easier to communicate with a smaller group of people that are very well informed about the business mm -hmm. than trying to communicate to a large body of people that may not really understand what's going on in your company. And investors who are there basically by invitation only, right? As opposed to the public investors who may include at some point or another an activist who uh, doesn't like what you're doing. Let's talk about that question of, of earnings guidance, which seems to be a, a grain of sand, maybe a big rock in the shoe of a lot of, uh, a lot of CEOs. Uh, where do they come down on this? Where do you come down on it? Well, so certainly the, the, the report that came out from Jamie Dimon, Warren Buffett, and others was definitely very much against the idea of uh, CEOs offering earnings guidance. It, it's good to have the information out there as far as earnings quarterly from a transparency perspective. But the quarterly and even between quarterly uh, attempts to try and get CEOs to give guidance about where they're going and whether they're going to hit or miss and, and by how much has turned this all into a game in many ways, where it really just becomes about trying to massage these mm -hmm. opinions in order to make sure that you, you, know, you, you actually can match expectations every time. That's not good for investors. It's not good for the CEOs. It's not really good for anyone in some ways, but it's kind of the incentive system that we've designed by kind of forcing CEOs to do this kind of gives them the incentive to want to do it. JP, nice to see you again. Good to have you back. We missed you. JP Thank you very much. with the uh, New York University Stern School of Business. Listen up, Ty. Finally tonight, it's the end of the line for the VCR. No. Yes, it is. The last company making video cassette recorders, yes, they're still being made, is reportedly ending production by the end of the month. The Japanese company says it's having a hard time getting the necessary parts to build the machines, wow. which were first launched about 40 years ago. Remember when they were new. My that goodness, and the, I love those eight track tapes. Eight -track Bring back the eight track. <laughs> Stop it. All right, that does it for us tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night, everybody. I'm Tyler Matheson. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. I don't even think my kids know who the PC part is. <laughs>